you probably already saw the title, some aspects of directed graphs, parts and cycles and diagrams. Because you see the, the area of directed graphs is huge, is huge. Because look, if you look at the, uh, the whole area of graph theory, then I, you can roughly uh, partition it in two parts. So one is undirected graphs and the other one is directed graphs. When, when you look at the applications, I think again, most people would agree that there are like 50-50, roughly 50-50 uh, uh, chance of uh, applying undirected graph or directed graph in various areas, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, genetics, whatever. Uh, and, uh, and so, so both are important. Both are important, obviously. Undirected and directed graphs. But, uh, but actually till uh, in, tw in, tw in the year 2000, Van Jensen and I published a book specifically on directed graphs, which has, if I remember correctly, more than 800 pages in it uh you know the all if you if you open the book on graph theory you will see maybe five or ten percent maximum on directed graphs there the rest was undirected graphs and that and we saw it you know two years before we published the book we saw that this is a big gap in the in 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 books on uh, graph theory therefore we decided together to do it and it took us, of course, two years to, to finish uh, the, the whole thing. Now, the second edition of that book, um, nine years later, uh, was even longer. But then we, we need, needed to be even more selective what is to include, what is not to include, because the area became huge, huge, and it's still growing very quickly. And I don't know. It's uh, it's it's it, it's very difficult now to 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 give a comprehensive kind of account of this area. So I thought, what to do? And then I decided that I will cover parts and cycle and diagrams. Even there, yeah, I will I will basically cover a small part of it. It's my kind of personal preferences here. Not really any comprehensive cover of that book. So just to give you some flavor of what's going on, some interesting results from my point of view in there. And if you kind of, if you are ever wanted to study directed graphs or use something from directed graphs, at least you hopefully will have some idea, maybe where to look for and, uh, and some main concepts, uh, some basic concepts there. But anyway, uh, we have only 90 minutes to go, now already 80, so let me go on. So let me start from some basics. Before I do it, it just I mentioned uh, this first edition of that book, it's here, second edition, uh, and, uh, and, the, and then uh, later we did not want to do the third edition, Springer, suggested to us to do the third edition. We said, no, it's, we would do a separate book. We edited it book. So that means it's uh, the chapters are, are written by different people, including us and specialists in particular topics in uh, directed graphs. And I think the book is, is really interesting, um, especially if you, or you want to know about, about some particular class of directed graphs, not in general. Uh, uh, especially if it's there is a chapter there about that. Um, what else I want to see say that yeah, the first edition was translated into Chinese as well. So again, it just shows that the book was uh, was uh, kind of useful. It turned out to be useful as we expected. Now, what is a directed graph or digraph uh, for short? Sure? So it's a set of vertices like one directed graphs and a set of arcs. So arcs, they are basically, they are like edges in directed graphs, they are undirected graphs, but there, there is a direction. So if you have U and V, there will be some, some direction here. Not that you can go from, say, 
U to V, or yeah, and you can go back here, you can go strictly from U to V. Now, if you want to show that you can go both directions, then you can use opposite arcs. You can call them edges if you want, but I prefer to call them arcs. Now, generally, usually when we consider directed graphs, we don't have loops. Loops are vertices like that, with uh, uh, arcs like that, starting and ending at the same vertex, or multiple or parallel arcs. Parallel arcs are arcs like this, or maybe more of those, with the same first point, first vertex, and and and, and second vertex. So, uh, so you 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 you. Uh, often you don't have it, but sometimes you need it. Now, what is a directed multigraph? Directed multigraph has, uh, may have parallel arcs. So then we speak about directed multigraphs. And then directed pseudograph may have both parallel arcs and loops. So everything is allowed here. So uh, pseudographs, for example, directed pseudographs are needed if you, for example, want to depict a relation, uh, ordinary relation, uh, then you, you need loops. And for that, usually you need loops and therefore you need pseudo directed pseudographs. Now, uh, what is a tournament? Some of you probably heard this term. Tournament is a directed graph in which there is exactly one arc between every pair of vertices. In other words, we can say it's an orientation of a complete graph. So let me give you an ex example. So for example, uh, take this, say three vertices, something like that. That's, that's a tournament. That's a tournament on three vertices. Okay, so what else? Uh, Semi-complete digraph. Semi-complete digraph is less known a term which is less known, but because many properties of tournaments are also, uh, 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 they also uh, are satisfied by semi-complete diagrams, it's worth sometimes to, to study those or use those somewhere. So, and they are so-called bio-orientations of complete graph. So what is, by orientation is you take again, say, you take say uh, three vertices, again, three vertices, and then you can have like before, but then you're allowed to have arcs going in the opposite direction. So here you see there is, there are two arcs going in the opposite direction, which means it's not a tournament, it's a semi-complete diagram. Okay, so not much difference, of course, but you will see that there is a difference. And every every uh, uh, tournament, of course, is a semi-complete diagram. So, what is a complete diagram? Complete diagram is a diagram in which there are two arcs between every pair of words. So it's denoted KN, but with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, arcs going in the opposite direction to, to kind of, to distinguish it from uh, ordinary undirected, complete undirected graph. So, so let me just give you a uh, three vertices. What is it? Complete directed graph is like that. So this is K3. This is K3, okay. So it's basically analog of uh, under, uh, undirected, complete undirected graph. But here we want to sometimes to specify that yes, it's a directed graph because for example, you can delete here an arc just one arc, uh, not necessarily two arcs in the opposite direction. 
And so it's it's a different object. It's a more general object than uh, complete a uh, complete undirected. So now, what is a walk? Walk is like for a uh, direct for undirected graphs. So it's a sequence of alternated vertices and arcs, such that uh, you know every arc is basically an arc between the uh, previous vertex and the next vertex. So here, direction is very important. So so for example, you can have a, uh, a walk like that, you can go like that, you can go like that. Then maybe you want to return back here and then continue in, in a different direction. Maybe you want to, to return again. So it's all a walk, it's all a walk. So obviously, naturally we want to follow this errors. We cannot go. Uh, opposite those cells. So this is a walk. And then uh, a trail is a walk without repeated arcs. Like for undirected graphs, also it's a trail. It's a walk without repeated arcs. Then a pass, which is one of our main topics here, is a walk without repeated vertices. So before that, you, you see that we repeated vertices here. Now, if you speak about paths, and we cannot repeat what this is anymore. So we, we can have something like that. But we cannot go back to the vertices which we already uh, traversed, right? And what is the length of a pass is the number of arcs there. So in this case, in this uh, example, it's just three. So the length is three. And the cycle is a walk without repeated vertices apart from the first and last. So, uh, so if you go here, we we can we can add another arc, say, and we get the cycle. And this cycle is uh, C four, so it's length four, C four. But if we want to distinguish uh, between this uh, directed cycle and undirected cycle, we put an error above it. And so that's kind of will distinguish this two. Uh, right. Uh, now, strongly connected. What is a strongly connected digraph? Strongly connected digraph, it, it's, it's strongly connected if you can, uh, for every ordered pair of vertices, you can go from the first to the second. So for example, let me take some example here. So you take if this tournament, which I depicted before, uh, uh, yeah. So this is not strongly connected because you cannot get from Y to X. You can not get from Y to, y to X. There is no possibility to do it. But for example, if you add, if you add uh, uh, an opposite arc here, the opposite arc here, and then it's strongly connected because you, you can go from Z to X via Z, from uh, Y to X via Z, and you can check, you can go uh, again between any, uh, any other object, from X to Y, obviously, from Z to X, yes, and and so on and so forth. So so you can reach every vertex uh, from every other vertex just uh, using a, a walk or pass or yeah. So that's strongly connected, and that's that's important as you can see uh, because we we uh, we uh, we are not allowed to go against the directions of Fox. Now let's move on now to parts and cycles and semi-complete multi-parted diagram. But first of all, let's talk about tournaments. Look, let's talk about Hamilton, Hamilton paths in tournaments. What is a Hamilton path? Path or cycle is, is Hamilton, or sometimes people say Hamiltonian. If it contains all vertices, if it covers all vertices, right? So by the way, if you have any questions or see something you want me to repeat, 
then don't wait to the end of this uh, presentation to this lecture simply uh, just just uh, because I, I'm not going to look at uh, at uh, what you are writing in, in the text so simply uh, simply interrupt me a bit at, and just ask that you tell me that you have a question a comment or whatever uh, I, I think I have enough time to cover everything even if I answer your questions. Right, so the first theorem basically, which we are going to consider here is that of Freddy. So that theorem simply says that every term element has a, Ham a Hamilton path, right? Very simple theorem. It says every tournament has a Hamilton path. When you see, the proofs, two proofs I'm going to show to you. It's an easy theorem, obviously. But it is so interesting that this theorem is used in various proofs and graph theory and not only in graph theory. And, and in general, what I wanted to say, what I want to say in this talk, apart from introduction you to direct graphs, is that it's surprisingly for me even now, how many purely theoretical results, which I thought were purely theoretical results, they in the end are used in real applications, in real life applications. Uh, well, sometimes when you absolutely unexpect that, and I will mention a couple of these applications later on. One of them, by the way, is an application of generalization of this of this uh, theory. Now, so every term has a Hamilton path. Now, what is a proof? Proof, I will use just figures. I'm not going to, I will try not to, to go so proofs like written proofs. It's, it's, it's boring, it's, it's tedious, it's, it's, uh, it's hard sometimes to follow. So uh, I, I will, try to draw pictures. That's, that's, that's why also graphs are so popular that you can draw them. You know, you can draw them so you can see, see them, see the arguments much easier than if you write it in, in words or formulas. So let's look at a first proof, especially easy proof. So let's take a, 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 a tournament. Let's take a tournament. And this tournament has, say, several vertices like that. And then we order, we will order these vertices in such a way that the number of arcs going forward, namely from left to right, is maximum possible. Maximum possible. So that's called the median order. Some people will call it median order. We will encounter median orders later on as well. So it's median order. And so what I, I repeat, the number of facts going in this tournament, we order such vertices in such a way that the number of facts going in from left to right is is maximum possible. Therefore, the number of facts going from right to left is minimum possible. So now suppose, and then look at what's going on with, with arcs between these two consecutive vertices. So suppose we have something like that. Suppose we have uh, all arcs go from left to right, apart from one, which goes from right to left. You see that one? So X and Y. So it goes not from X to Y, but from Y to X. So, so what is wrong about that? The wrong thing is this. What you can do, you can, can swap X and Y. You can do the same thing as before, but you will put first y and then you put x. And the rest you don't change. So you, you see what happened. 
it happened that you increase the number of forward arcs by one, decreased, well, increased it by one without changing any other arc, being forward or, or backward. So you, you added one forward arc, but you did not uh, in, in, in change uh, the, the, any other di direction, any other arc, this kind of uh, status of any other arc. It, if it was forward, it remains forward. If it was backward, it remains backward, right? So, so that means that what we saw before, the first picture was wrong. That was not a median uh, order. Now we have possibly median order, right? Or at least in the process, we, we proved that there is this tournament has a Hamiltonian Hamilton side. I pass. Hamilton path. Okay, that's an easy proof. Now, if you want some some other proof, which generally can be found in books, then it's a proof by induction. So, what what by induction? It means that remove one vertex from tournament. The by induction hypothesis, uh, you have a path. You have a Hamilton path, and what's left? So we have a Hamilton pass in what's left. And then look at another vertex. It's another vertex here. What's going and see how it relates to, to the other vertex. Now, if it's if you have an arc like that, if you have an arc like that, that immediately tells us that there is a Hamilton pass, right? So easy. So now assume that this is not the case. Uh, it's not the case. So what does it mean? It means that there is an arc in this direction because it's a tournament. So there must be an arc between this red vertex and the first blue vertex. Now, of course, if we continue, if if we continue at some point, some point of time, we'll have one arc going down and one arc going up. Right? It's one possibility. Well, what we do then. We just we just go here till we first meet this arc, last arc going down, and then we go up and pick up the rest of the vertices. Of course, there is another possibility. Another possibility is that you know is that we we have all these directions, all in this of course this path. And, and everything goes down. But if everything goes down, yeah, then of course we can traverse first all the, all the vertices uh, at the top and then go down and pick up the, the vertex which we deleted. So again, this, this, this gives us a, a Hamilton pass. So it's trivial, I don't know, maybe, I'm bored. I, I, I'm telling something simple already, uh, but uh, but uh, it's basically so far introduction to to. So sorry, Prof. You, you mentioned something about about the median order. Can you please repeat the definition of that? A median order is an order. Uh, if you take a digraph, median order is the order in uh, of the vertices such that the number of forward arcs going from left to right is maximum possible. Because, for example, let me give you an example. Maybe then it will become clearer. So if you, if you take like this, suppose that you have a tournament like this. Simple tournaments with three vertices, right? So 
<laughs> right? So that's median order because it's you cannot have more than three x full. On the other hand, this is x, y, z. Suppose for some reason you want to put them like that, then what happens? This is far from median order. That has zero arcs going forward, but you want maximum, right? Of course, not always this possible if, for example, here, the direction of this arc is the opposite, is the opposite then, of course, uh, uh, you cannot you cannot make all arcs go from left to right, but two you can, of course, two you can, and that's median order. Right. All right. So uh, so now, in fact, Reddy proved that every tournament has an odd number of Hamilton paths odd number. So it could be one, three, five, whatever. Now that proof is, 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 is more sophisticated and not going to go through it. Uh, uh, so, but actually, in fact, he proved a stronger result, but usually people are happy with this simpler formulation, like every tournament has a Hamilton pass. That's normally what they use, not odd number. Now let's move on to semi-complete diagraph. So I remind you that a semi-complete diagraph has an arc between every pair of vertices and possibly two arcs in opposite directions. Now every semi-complete diagraph has a Hamilton path. That's practically obvious. So why it's obvious? What is a simple proof here? Well, simple proof here is simply reduction to Rayleigh's theorem. What we can do, we can take, if, if there are arcs in the opposite direction, for every such pair, just remove one of those arcs and you get in the end the tournament, apply Rayleigh's theorem, and you have a Hamilton path, right? So, so you don't need to prove it separately. But is it true that if you, take the full version of Rayleigh's theorem, it's still true that ever is it is every semi-complete diagraph has an odd number of Hamiltonian path, Hamilton path? No, because even if you take uh, K2, complete diagraph with two vertices, which is simply something like it's, it's this, this. So as you can see, it has just two, Hamilton pass, every arc is a Hamilton pass, and, uh, and it has two, not, not odd number. So as you can see, there is some difference between tournaments and semi-complete diagrams already uh, here. Now, let me say a few words about uh, recent results on parts and tournaments. So, so tournaments maybe sometimes looks like something simple, uh, which is not. And, uh, and by the way, the number of all tournaments is asymptotically the same as the number of all undirected graphs, easily. It's not hard to understand why, right? So, so uh, and therefore it's a huge, it's a huge class of graphs, huge class of graphs. Now, so, and of course, research on this class of graph is still going on. Now a tournament is T is regular if there is an integer K such that out degree and in degree of every vertex equals to K. Now I, uh, so <clears throat> I don't remember that I introduced this notion of the, of the uh, out degree and in degree before, but let me quickly introduce it. What it means is that out degree is basically of x is the number of x going from x. Yeah, so in this case, say it's part of our diagraph and uh, vertex x has just 
four parts going out of it, right? Out of it. So in this case, our degree is four. In degree, say of y, let's say it's three. Why is that? Because there are just three arcs into it. So it's three. So it is three. Okay, so now it's regular, tournament is regular if for every vertex we have the same out degree as in degree and it's the same along all this tournament. So of course it's not uh, some simple uh, regular diagrams is, is this. So if you take cycle of length three, then it's a regular tournament because for every vertex you see that in degree and out degree of every vertex is 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 one. So for five vertices you can do <coughs> for five vertices it's not hard to to take a re, uh, to create a regular tournament on on uh, five vertices for example by I don't know take five. Uh, so this is five, yeah, so complete. And then orient, so orient here uh, or along this direction and add also uh, also uh, kind of here, direction here, direction here, direction here, direction here and direction here. So if you look again at what I drew, for every vertex, there are two arcs going out and two arcs going in, and it's a regular tournament. It's a regular tournament again. So, <clears throat> so now we also what we want in our notation, we want to write this interval in integer interval between p and q, where it's p, p plus one, and so on till q. So it's an integer interval. Uh, so, uh, so with Dabinan, Samuel Dabinan, we proved, we published basically this year, the following theorem. It says that let T be a regular tournament with two N plus one vertices, which is at least 11. And let S be a subset of these vertices, of our vertices here. Suppose also that S is of size at most half of N minus two, and X and Y are two distant vertices in, in the in the tournament, but not in S. If T minus S contains then an X, Y path, a path from X to Y of lengths R, where R is in this interval between three and two N minus S minus one, then T minus S also contains an X, Y path of lengths R plus one. So, you can understand that, uh, you know, we are talking, if we remove some set of vertices from T, uh, which is of kind of half uh, up to roughly half vertices of this tournament, then, and for every pair of vertices, you can still uh, can, uh, can uh, uh, <coughs> find paths basically of every possible length starting from three, right? So, uh, now, if there is such a pass, then it also contains a, a, a much a longer pass by one. So, and you can continue like that. So, you if you have pass say of length three, then you will have a pass of length four, length five, and so on. Uh, inductively, you can see that all 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 lengths are from x to y are possible. And uh, and. Uh, so this result basically generalizes uh, several known results from earlier, from many years ago. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, it's a quite powerful result as I will see, show to you a bit later. So here it's what we, uh, so P, if, if we have a diagraph, uh, which is, has P vertices, it's called strongly pan connected or respectively, T strongly path connected, where D is in this interval between three and P minus one. If there is an X, Y and 
both x y and y x path in D, both of lengths k, for any two vertices x y, and each k between three and p minus one. In case of pi connected, in D pi connected, it's only for k between D and p minus one. Right. So. So what we proved. Uh, and also uh, another notion which we need is the tournament is M irregular if you, oh, here I see, I uh, forgot to put um, one thing is missing here. And this is this, uh, okay, what is this? Yeah, so the absolute value of, oh, even two things are missing here of d plus of x minus d minus of x for absolute value is less or equal than m for every x, for every vertex here. So in other words, if you take every vertex, then the number of outgoing and incoming arcs are different by m, at most by m, in one direction or the other direction, maybe more outgoing than incoming or maybe the other way around, but the difference is at most M. So it's not regular. For regular, or regular, of course, it's, it's uh, zero irregular. Zero irregular, it's, it's the same as regular, right? So, so here we can generalize the notion of a regular tournament. And what we proved is this. A tournament is M irregular. Uh, yeah, so what we proved with Dabinan is that let T be an M irregular tournament or for the P such that P plus M and at least 11. And if M is less or equal than this fraction or one third of P minus five or respectively M is less or equal than one fifth of P minus three, then T is four strongly punk connected and respectively T is strongly punk connected or belongs to a well-defined family of tournaments. So essentially, this result is for more than a regular tournaments. It's a class of tournaments which are close to regular, but not regular. And we proved this result using the previous theorem, which I, I showed to you. So we reduced all of this stuff to, to regular tournaments. And therefore, we could speak about this pun connected stuff unconnected stuff. So, so that's that sort of thing. Again, both results, uh, the, the, especially the one before uh, with Dabinan, they're pretty difficult to prove there. I mean, not because they use some kind of difficult maths or something like that, but yeah, they use a lot of uh, case analysis, as I say, well, you look at this case, that case and so on. But of course, you need to, to organize these cases. You need to know which one to look at, how to produce this proof. But the proof is pretty long, pretty long in this case. Okay. Now, uh, I'll finish here with Hamilton path for tournaments. And I will consider now uh, Hamilton uh, uh, cycles and semi-complete cycles. So, the first result was by Camion in 1959. So remember, Rede proved his result in 1934. Camion, for Camion, it took 25 years to, to prove a similar result for uh, Hamilton cycles. So a tournament T has a Hamilton cycle if and only if T is strong or strongly connected. So I remind you what it means. It means that you have uh, pass from every vertex to every other vertex in each direction, right? So if you have X and Y, you have a pass from X to Y and from Y, and you also have a pass from Y to X, and then it's strong. So obviously, if a, if a, digraph, has, if a, a digraph has a Hamilton cycle, then using this Hamilton cycle, you can travel from every vertex to every vertex, right? In both directions. Therefore, obviously, this to be strongly or strongly connected or strong is a necessary condition 
But what is interesting that for tournaments, it's also a sufficient condition. It's a sufficient condition as well. So it's pretty simple. <coughs> this, uh, this, this result is formulated pretty simple, but the proof of it is, is less simple than Rayleigh's theorem. Now, in fact, later people, people generalize this result and they uh, use a notion of vertex concyclicity. An n vertex diagram D is a vertex concyclic if for every i from three to n and every vertex V in D, there is a cycle of lengths i containing V. So you take any vertex, you take any lengths from three and you find a cycle. And uh, so what Moon proved in 1966 is that a tournament is good exponcyclic, cyclic if and only if is, it is strong. So you see, it's, it's not only Hamilton cycle, it has cycle of any possible length, right? And through every vertex. So it's, and so, so I'm not going to present to you a proof of this result. But there will be after this lecture. There will be a, a uh, will be a problem session. Yeah, and uh, my PhD student Yakum will will show you uh, this proof. Right and now, what is two kings in tournaments? A vertex v in a diagraph is a k king for every v. Uh, every vertex v, there is a pass of length at most k from v to uh, uh, to that vertex uh, u. So, so you you a k king. It means that you can reach every vertex from that king by at most uh, k steps, right? And then, of course, we use this notion of in neighbor. It's all vertices. Which, uh, uh, which basically uh, all vertices such that if we have v, say if we have v, then all vertices which basically have arcs into v, they are in this neighborhood. So it's u1, say u2, and u3. They are all in neighbors of v, and if they are all in neighbors, then they call their form. Uh, and they're in neighborhood of, of V. Now, uh, similarly, you can define out neighborhood of V where you basically, where you, where you uh, take, of course, V and look at all vertices which you can reach in one step. Say W, W, W1, W2, W3. Okay, so so that's that's that. And uh, and uh, and for, uh, using them, you can you can define this out neighbors and in neighbors of the vertex. They are simply sizes of neighborhoods, sizes of the neighborhoods. So, so what Landau proved in 1953, uh, observing some chicken. So that was that was really kind of funny thing. But he 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 motivated his result by observation of some behavior of chicken chickens. So every tournament has a two king. Every tournament has a two king. That means that there is a vertex in every tournament which can reach any other vertex in two steps. Well, it's simple here. Consider how to prove. You consider vertex V of maximal out, maximal out neighborhood, which means it's a neighbor out neighborhood which which is which is not contained in the out neighborhood of any other vertex. And what this is a two king. We say that this is a two king. Why? Well, it's easy to persuade yourself. So you take V, put its out neighbors, right? All its out neighbors. 
And then suppose you have another vertex left, U. Now what can happen with this vertex? This vertex, of course, is not in this uh, out neighborhood of V, therefore the arc should go from U to V. But you cannot have arcs into the neighbor, out neighborhood of V, all arcs. Why? Because otherwise its out neighborhood would be bigger than out neighborhood of V. So therefore, there must be one, at least one vertex in this out neighborhood of V for which there is an arc into U. Remember, this is a tournament. So one arc must exist between, say, this X and U. So if, it, if it's not in U, X, then it's X, U. Right? So, so now you see this pass of lengths too from V to you. So that's that's as simple as that. So there is nothing nothing uh, difficult in this result, of course. But it's one of these uh, simplest but fundamental results about tournaments. Okay, so uh, and then Moon uh, proved further in 1962 that every tournament without a vertex of in degree zero, so no uh, vertex which doesn't have, uh, there is no vertex uh, to which no arc goes in, uh, go, uh, to, to which, which uh, no, no vertex which basically uh, uh, for which all arcs go out of it has at least three to king. So if there is no such universal kind of vertex which dominates everybody, then there are at least three to kings and the bound is of three is sharp. So you cannot improve it to, 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 to two, for example. So, and uh, now let me move on now to uh, the semi-complete bipartite digraph of uh, uh, semi-complete bipartite digraph is a bi-orientation of a complete bipartite graph. So, and bipartite it's bipartite analog of semi-complete digraphs. So, if you if you look at uh, so you take for example, just say bipartite complete bipartite graph undirected. And then you put arcs in each direction you like, random direction, whatever, whatever direction you want. And then you get uh, the, get uh, a bipartite tournament in this case, but if you add some arcs in the opposite direction, then you get a, you get a semi-complete uh, bipartite, uh, uh, semi-complete bipartite diagram. Right, this sort of thing. Okay, so this is a natural analog of semi-complete diagrams. Now, semi-complete multipartite diagram is a bi-orientation of complete multipartite graph. It's generalization of semi-complete digraphs as well. So that means you, you can not only bipartite, uh, uh, complete bipartite graph, you can consider complete multipartite like three, say, you know, three color classes, and then put all edges between different color classes. Yeah, all possible edges and then orient, uh, uh, this this uh, uh, this uh, 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 edges and you will get multipartite tournament, what we call multipartite tournament. But if you add maybe some opposite direction arcs, then you will get semi-complete multipartite diagram. And uh, so now let's uh, we want to talk about Hamilton path in semi-complete multipartite diagrams. So a one pass cycle factor of a digraph is a Spanian subdigraph 
uh, of T, which consists of vertex disjoint components, one of which is a path and the rest are cycles. So, so you see, for example, in a graph, as a subgraph, you have path, uh, path, and then you also have some cycles, some cycles. And if they are all disjoint and cover all the vertices, then it's called one pass cycles factor. So one pass means it's just one pass and the rest are cycles. And of course, the rest cycles means that there is no cycles at all. So this definition also includes the case when there are no cycles, only pass. So therefore having a one pass cycle factor is necessary condition for a digraph to have a Hamilton path, right? It's a necessary condition. So what I proved in 1985 and later in 1989 by Hagvist and Monosakis is that a semi-complete bipartite digraph has a Hamilton path, if and only if it contains a one pass cycle, right? So, so the the so now I I believe Hagvist and Manasakis discovered this result independently. And that's what they told me also because my my uh, paper was published in Russian and their paper of course in English. So so probably they didn't read my paper in in, in Russian because I I till 1990 I lived in in Soviet Union, so I wrote my papers in Russian. Okay, and, uh, and later, I actually generalized this result to semi-complete multi-party diagraphs. Uh, semi-complete uh, uh, semi multi-party diagraph has a Hamilton passive, if and only if it contains a one pass cycle factor, and in polynomial time, we can decide whether D has a Hamilton pass. So, uh, the proof of the first result is pretty easy, but the proof of the second result is not really. I mean, it's it's not difficult, but you really need to to use the right kind of induction, and the induction is not true. So and Hagvis and Manasakis, by the way, did not come up uh, across this result, so they stopped the, the bipartite case. Okay, now how we can prove this stuff? Well, we can, we can, it's enough to consider a pass and a cycle because if there are no cycles, then there is nothing to prove. If there are many cycles, what you can do, you can take first pass and cycle, merge them together, then look at the result, resultant pass, merge it together with the second cycle and so on. So. The actual case, only interesting case is one pass and one cycle. So let's look at it. Let's look at it. So we'll look at uh, the pass. And let's look at the cycle. Okay. And then we, we observe that if there is, if this last first vertex of the path, if there is an arc from, uh, if there is an arc from the cycle to this vertex, right? First vertex of the path, then we are done. Because we can start from this vertex here, and go across the cycle, go to the path and pick up all the vertices. So then it's easy, then we are done. So that means we, we assume that this is not the case. If it's not the case, then what? Then here it goes down and all arcs going down. So we can say that here all arcs are going down all arcs from there are going down, right? And suppose that we, this arc also are arcs going down. 
but and here, but at this one, there is an arc which goes up. Here there is an arc which goes up. Then what, what, that's again very simple. Now, what we do, we go along the path, we go along the path first, we go along the path here, then we go there, then we pick up all the uh, vertices here and go up and then continue along the path. And that's that's it. Now what's left is of course the case when this path here and the 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 then the, the there is an arc. There is there is uh, 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 here also the for, for even for the last vertex for all vertices for the last one in particular everything goes down. But then it's easy, you just pick up all the vertices of the path and then go down to the cycle, pick up all the vertices of the cycle. So that's that's again, pretty, pretty simple uh, proof, not a hard proof. Uh, but as I said, for the multi-parted case, it's, it's more difficult. I'm not going to present it here. <clears throat> okay, so, Now let's uh, so let's go uh, let's go further. Now let's look at Hamilton cycles now in semi-complete multi-parted diagram. So we finished basically with Hamilton path. Now we want to see. Hamilton cycles, what's going on? Because for tournaments, we know what it is. For Hamilton cycles here is that it's a notion of cycle factor, which will be important. The cycle factor in a diagraph is a Spanish subdiagraph of T, which consists of vertex joint components, one of which is a cycle. Uh, no, all of which are cycles, uh, which consist all of which are cycles. So you see, again, here I need to, to correct this. All of which are cycles. So I will correct my slide before I send it to organizers. Um, so essentially it's, they look, this cycle factors, they look like this. So they're just cycle, collection of cycles, disjoint cycles. And uh, and they cover all the verbs. So again, so I uh, proved that a semi-complete bipartite diagram has a Hamilton cycle if and only if it is strong, strongly connected, strong, and contains a cycle factor. Again, I was earlier than uh, Hagvist and Manasakis, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, again, it's, uh, yeah, they, they've done it independently. So, so necessary condition is obviously trivial because, you know, if one cycle, you have a Hamilton cycle, then it's a cycle factor. So, so nothing to prove. Now proof of the sufficient condition is given below. So it's given below. Uh, this theorem, this theorem doesn't hold for semi-complete multi-party diagrams, even with three-party. Three-party, it doesn't work anymore. Um, but so, because, you know, unlike tournaments, it's, it's, it doesn't work anymore. This condition uh, with cycle factor doesn't work anymore. It's not sufficient. And, uh, but with Bang Jensen and Anders Yo, we proved that deciding whether a semi-complete multi-party diagram has a Hamilton cycle can be done in polynomial time. This, pretty, this proof is pretty tough, pretty tough. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Now, how to prove the, this result on the, uh, in the case of bipartite diagram, uh, semi-complete. So here, I, I will show you. So we, we uh, basically uh, consider, we, we introduce the following thing. That's, we have two cycles, C and Z, uh, uh, which are vertex disjoint. And we say that C dominates Z if for every vertex um, C in C and Z in Z of different colors, so they are from different parted sets. We have that C Z is in is the arc, not the other one. And the other one is Z from C is not in arc. So all arcs, in other words, all arcs go from C, all possible arcs go from C to Z. Now, what it says is that if you have this lemma, it has that if we have a cycle factor such that each for each pair of vertices in which, uh, you know, uh, 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 for which either uh, CI dominates CJ or CJ dominates CI, then D has a Hamilton cycle. So this particular case of uh, uh, cycle factor, we, we have a Hamilton set. So why is that? Well, this is not hard to prove because look, we, we can, we introduce a tournament here. Tournament is this. So it has, say, if we have a cycle factor with T cycles, then the uh, the vertices of this uh, graph of tournament is numbers from one to T and X, is ij is an arc if ci dominates cj if all arcs from ci or all possible arcs from ci go to cj now since d is strong t is also strong and so t has a hamilton cycle by this commune theorem remember now what's left is this you simply look at this let me let me show you again to draw it because that's that's uh, the easiest way to, to quickly show you what's going on. So you see, we have this Hamilton cycle here or in T. So what we need to do, we need to start with one of the cycles, you know, start at some vertex, pick up all vertices because uh, because it's in this cycle, then go to, to the next cycle, pick up all vertices, go to the next, and so on. And and uh, because it's it's a tournament, it's it's you will see that the parity parity kind of uh, 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 simple parity arguments will show you that you will pick up in the end all vertices and return to the initial vertex and return to the initial vertex. So so that's basically a proof of this uh, result. Now, so what's left basically is to prove that another lemma, because look, if, if all these cycles in cycle factor, they are organized such a way that they basically dominate each other, then we saw what happens. Now, suppose we have a case when two cycles dominant, don't dominate each other, which means that there are arcs going from C to Z and from Z to, to C, I mean, in both directions. So what, what we are going to do? So here we can use lemma two, which says that if D is a strongly, strong semi-complete bipartite diagram and C and Z are vertex joint cycles in D, such that this uh, uh, subgraph induced by the two vertices of these two cycle is strong, then, then uh, in, in this subgraph, we have a Hamilton cycle. In other words, we can say that we can merge these two cycles into one cycle, into one cycle by mixing the vertices in, 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 this, in this. So now here is, <clears throat> the proof is, uh, let's say is a, a bit more complicated and I will simplify it a little bit by assuming 
uh, that the lengths of both cycles C and Z are the same. It's not necessarily the case in general, but suppose it is the case here. And well, it's not hard to, if you think a little bit about that, to generalize it in the general case. Right, so what we have here is we have, say, suppose we have, I don't know, six here, one cycle, six here, the other cycle, and, uh, and then go like that, and here we go like that. And, uh, and then, and then what we can no, no, notice is that if we have an arc here, right? So first of all, they say what this is one kind of vertices from one part, uh, from one uh, part it sets, this is from the other part it set. They, they have to be kind of uh, alternating. So here it should be this, so here it should be this, should be this, and this should be this, okay? So now if you have this arc, then, then you cannot have, or you, you can have, of course, but that would make it easy for us to, ah, I forgot one other thing to do. So of course, because it's a cycle, it is a cycle. So we need the other arc. And here we need this arc as well. So we cannot, if we have say an arc like that now, then it's, then it's easy. What we can do, we can go along this left cycle, starting from the vertex of this red arc, red arc, and then pick up everything, then go along this blue arc from cycle to cycle and pick up the other. The, the, the vertices of the other one and then return using this uh, uh, red arc. So it's easy to see there is a, 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 a this there's a, a cycle merging both of them. So which means that that in such a case we have to have if it's we want something more interesting, then we need to assume that all these arcs are parallel kind of all parallel arcs, you see what I, I mean by parallel, they go into one direction. But then the, the thing is this, that you cannot have, if you take any arc, you cannot have parallel, it's parallel x going from left to right, because that would, that would, uh, that would say that this, this uh, two, cycles, they, one of them, the left one dominates the right one. So it's not right. So therefore we have to have this sort of thing. We have to have this sort of things. So we have to have an arc, which, which basically goes like that, which goes from right to left, from right cycle to the left side. And again, all its parallel arcs are going in the same direction. Now, what we can do now, we can start, that's enough. Now you start with vertex one, you go to vertex two, right? Then, then you go, then you go, uh, uh, say, then you go, I don't know. Well, maybe blue, take blue. Okay, well, we go then here. I oh, know we go here, right? This is vertex three. This is vertex four. Vertex four. And then we take this red arc and go to five and then to six. Then go again uh, vertically seven, eight, then jump here, take nine, 10, and, and then again, take, take, take the vertical one, 
and that's 11, 12, and not hard to see it. And from 12, you can go to, to one. 12, you can go to one around, along this, uh, 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 from, from right to left. So you, you can persuade yourself that you can do it. So this way you can merge these two cycles in this case, All right? So I don't want to go more into these details because we are running out of time. I, I was naive thinking that I have too much time. In fact, I have too little time. Now, uh, so if I multiplied it, so, uh, uh, so also proved back in, in the 80s that uh, if a multiparty tournament has at most one vertex of in degree zero, then it has a four king. So un unless in the case of tournaments, so two kings are not enough, you need to consider four kings, but, but you, unless there is a vertex of it, uh, 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 there are two more vertices of in degree zero, then we, we have a, uh, has a four king. And that's what I proved in 1986. And then later Petrovich and Thomas, and they proved the same thing in 1991. So, so, so what, what it, why, why we need this condition that at most one vertex? Well, because if you have two vertices, say they are in the same part, in the same part, it's, it's in the same color. And the all arcs going out of them, then of course you cannot reach from one to other. But if there is a possibility to reach somebody, it's at most four steps from one of the words. Right? So that's 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 the result. And it's again amazing how Petrovich and Thomas and they discovered this independently. Right. Um, now, with Anders Yor, later in 2000, we proved that if a semi-complete multi-party diagram has at most one vertex of in degree zero, then it has four kings. So basically, we generalized this result, slightly generalized this result. We proved that a more uh, interesting result there in that paper, but I'm not going to go into this. Now, the proof of this serum, late, last serum, will be in the problem session. Now. Now Hamilton cycles in degree constraints diagrams. Now we are going to consider some uh, some sufficient conditions. I'm look I'm looking at the fact that I have only ten minutes left. Maybe I can have fifteen minutes because we started a bit later, but nevertheless it's going to be pretty quick uh, quick tour um, among this. Uh, sufficient conditions for diagraph to have Hamiltonian cycle. So first of all, what is the degree of a vertex is the sum of in degree and out degree of the vertex. So essentially, if you add together the number of outgoing arcs and incoming arcs, that's the degree of a vertex in, in direct for the uh, direct graph. So now we say that the power of vertex is x, y of d is dominated if there is a vertex z, which Basically, if there is a vertex z, so we have x and y, and if there is a vertex z such that it's both arcs going to x and y, then then it's dominated. It's dominated. Now, what we proved uh, in uh, uh, I proved with Van Jensen and Lee. In 1996, is that if D is a strong diagraph with at least two vertices, and suppose that for every pair x, y of non adjacent dominated vertices, not just any vertices, non adjacent dominated vertices, either the, the out degree, the degree of x is at least n, and the degree of y is at least n minus one, or the other way around, then D has a Hamilton cycle. And again, the proof of this result is given in the problem session. Now, there are other, uh, there is a corollary of this result. This is a result proved in 1960, uh, where if the uh, uh, out degree, if the degree of every virus is at least n, then D has a Hamilton cycle. Obviously, it's a corollary here. And then also, if you look at the notion of uh, minimum 
uh, uh, semi degree of T, which is minimum of all out degrees and in degrees of vertices. And then uh, clearly another corollary is that if this minimum uh, semi degree of D is at least N over two, then it has a Hamilton cycle. So this generalizes, uh, uh, generalizes uh, uh, one of the results on, on undirected curves. Right. Um, now, also, Manuel proof theorem, uh, proof theorem in 1973 that if D is a strong digraph with at least two vertices, and if some of the degrees of two vertices is at least two n minus one for all non adjacent pairs of vertices, x and y, right? So the non adjacent means that there are no arcs between them. Then D has a Hamilton cycle. So it is essentially generalizes commune theorem for tournaments. And then there is this, another theorem, which actually is a special case of manual theorem. So, which says that if D is a digraph with n minus uh, at least uh, uh, two vertices, and you know this out degree of x plus in degree of y is at least 10 for all pairs x, y vertices in D such that there is no arc from x to y, then D has a Hamilton cycle. Now the question is why on earth I mentioned Woodall's theorem. And again, this is one of the cases which I wanted to tell you about. This is one of those cases. When I saw that Woodall theorem and saw that it's basically a special case of manual theorem, I thought, well, should I include it in my book on directed graphs? Well, I thought, okay, maybe for completeness of history kind of, I will include it. It's not needed, but I will include it. And I was right. Why? Because a year ago, a year and a half ago, I was contacted by Professor Bruce Coletti from America. I don't know him personally, but I believe he's, uh, he's professor in one, uh, professor in one of the universities there, and he is interested in applications. He's not very much interested in theory, he's interested in application. And then he told me one question. I'm sure, am I sure that in theorem of Woodall, I do not need to ask this digraph to be strongly connected because in, in this uh, manual theorem, you see, uh, we require this diagram to be strongly connected. Why in theorem of Woodall, we do not require it to be strongly connected? I said, yes, we don't need to require it because we can prove that these conditions imply that this diagram is strongly connected. And then he said, oh, thank you very much because that means we can use this theorem in our application. What is this application? I don't know details to this day because it's probably something relatively secret, maybe. Because apparently in some new kind of neural networks, right? Machine learning stuff. So, but they, they needed the theorem like that, which doesn't require a diagraph to be strongly connected. Well, it follows that it's strongly connected, but, but for, for their reason, re reasons, which I don't know exactly why, they did not want to, they could compute this, the, uh, this degrees of vertices, but they don't want, did not want to check that it's strongly connected. So, and this way, again, I learned that, yes, there are some theorems which you think are use, useless now. Turned out they're not, they're not. All right. Now also, that, that was another thing happened, I don't know, about six years ago, seven years ago. There is a theorem which Galley Milgram theorem improved in 1960, <clears throat> proved in 1960, it generalizes the, this Reddy theorem. What this theorem says, Galley Milgram, so Galley Milgram,
This theorem says the following. Suppose a directed graph has uh, the dependent set number alpha. So what is this? This is the maximum number of vertices in the diagram, which you can uh, pick up to, so that they, they form an independent set. Means the set where there is no arc between any pair of vertices. Now, what they proved is that in this case, <clears throat> you can choose always a one pass factor, not cycle factor, one pass factor. Not, no, 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 alpha of d factor. You can find alpha d factor in such a graph. What it means? It means, in other words, there are, there are alpha d pass or less pass which are disjoint and cover all vertices, which are disjoint and cover all vertices. So again, well, I knew about this theorem, it's included in the book. And I thought, well, a nice result, not very hard proof, not easy, but not very hard, <clears throat> but it's pretty much theoretical stuff. Till about seven years ago, uh, with some other guys, we applied this theorem to, to prove something about a scheme in uh, excess, basically a scheme in uh, uh, information security communication. So how to do something in a different way and uh, yeah, in a different way. And it turned out that to prove, to prove the property of this, that this communication can work, we needed to use this Galley Milgram theorem. So not that it's needed to, to introduce this communication, but to show that this is a secure communication, you needed to, to this theorem. All right, so. Now, in the graph theory, in directed graph theory, there are some unsolved problems, uh, unsolved conjectures. I, oh, oh, I, I put two conjectures like that, but uh, I will not have for the second one time for the second one, so I will cover only the first one. So the first one says that what is the second out neighborhood of V is basically all uh, all all vertices which you can reach from your word from this vertex in one or two steps, one or two steps. Ah, oh, no, no, no. In this case, two steps. Exactly two steps. Yes, exactly two steps. So you cannot reach them in one step. You need two steps to reach them. And what is the oriented graph is a, is digraph without cycles of length two. So you don't have arcs in the opposite directions, in other words. And same uh, quite a while ago suggested the following conjecture. Every oriented graph has a vertex X such that its first neighborhood, the size of the first neighborhood, less or equal as the size of the second neighborhood and such a vertex is called a same vertex nowadays. <clears throat> now, if you look at a complete direct graph, then you will see that the conjecture does not hold for general digraph because the second neighborhood size for every vertex is zero. And first one is uh, n minus one, so clearly, it's not true. Now it's easy to see that this conjecture holds for every diagraph with vertex of out degree zero, because if out degree zero, then both sides of first and second neighborhoods are the same as zero. Now bipartite as well, why for bipartite diagraphs is also true. Well, take a vertex with out degree, maximum out degree. No, minimum out degree, minimum out degree, right? Minimum out degree. And then look what happens. 
you, you go there and then you see uh, at the other side of this uh, digraph of the other part it said you you will see that you have you take a vertex and go from there back to the first side you came from so so take a so you have these two part eight sets right these two part eight sets of this bipartite then you choose a vertex which has which has minimum number of arcs going out so for example two and then you take a vertex from here whatever it is you see that the number of arcs going from this vertex will be at least two or maybe more and then already these vertices they are part of the second neighborhood while this is just the first neighborhood and clearly by this our assumption the size of the second neighborhood is at least as large as the size of the first out neighborhood so so that's easy now that's that's more or less uh, uh, ends easy stuff because even to prove that the conjecture holds for tournaments took a while fisher proved it in 1996 using uh, non-elementary stuff which basically they, they put, he proved this uh, the existence of a same vertex but he could not his approach could not find such a vertex in a tournament later Hawe and thomas said they in 2000 they proved using simple methods using this uh, median orders but not just median orders local median orders so median order is what the order of vertices such that the number of forward arcs is 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 the maximum possible and then he introduced also the the local they introduced local median orders it's introduced here and they they basically prove that the the last vertex in this order is the same vertex so so that's all they proved. Now I think I need to finish here because I don't want to go much over time. I already, well, we started later. So I don't think I, I went over time, but I don't want to, to go further than that. Now, I don't know if anybody has a question or two, please let me know now. If not, then I will uh, finish the lecture here. I, I do have a question for you. you. You mentioned something, and I think probably I missed, I missed the definition. Can you can you show me an example of 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 a cyclic, sorry, a cyclic factor? You say it's cyclic factor, and you used it in two results earlier on. But uh, yeah, cyclic factor, as I said, it's just a collection of cycles, right? It's a collection of cycles with which are disjoint, they don't have common vertices, right? Yeah, maybe some other, but they cover all vertices. So they cover all vertices, but they, they, they disjoint, so they don't have any common vertices, but they cover all vertices of the diagram. So in particular, if you have only one cycle in the diagram, right? contained in all vertices, Hamilton cycle. So that's a special case of cycle factor. So factor means that it's 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 uses all vertices. And cycle means that only components are cycles, basically. I mean cycles. You can have you can have of course other arcs as well, but the, the arcs which are interested we are interested in they are all uh, 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 on those cycles. Is, it, is this clear? Yes, yes, it is clear now. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Right, okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that I introduced so many notions, perhaps that so much material is very difficult to, to kind of, uh, 
to kind of um, yeah comprehend all this at, in a short period of time. But the slides will be available uh, to have a look later on. And thank you very much for your attention. And I will uh, I will finish my lecture now, allowing you for twenty minutes break, and uh, and Yakon will continue with problem session. Thank you again. Bye.